Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Mike Cleland. Mike is an avid outdoorsman, illustrator, and UFO researcher. He has written extensively on the subject of alien abductions, synchronicities, and owls. It was his firsthand experiences with these elusive events that have been the foundation of this research. His website, Hidden Experience, ex explores these events and their connections to the alien contact phenomenon. The site also features over 200 hours of audio interviews with visionaries and experts examining the complexities of the overall UFO experience. Beyond that, Mike is considered an expert in the skills of ultralight backpacking and has authored or illustrated a series of instructional books focused on advanced outdoor techniques. He spent nearly 25 years living in the Rockies and now lives in the Adirondacks. And Mike's books, the first one is The Messengers, Owls, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee. And he's since followed that up with a new book, a companion to The Messengers, called Stories from the Messengers. Accounts of Owls, UFOs, and a Deeper Reality. So without any further ado, Mike Cleland, welcome to the Cosmic Searchboard Show. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike, uh, this is a fascinating subject. People like Whitley Strieber have talked about the owl connection. And then we go back into in antiquity. We see that the ancients always held, or not always held, but a lot of them held the owl in reverence. And they regarded it as a symbol of knowledge and wisdom and mysticism. So before we get all into that, could, could you tell the audience a bit about yourself and, and how you came to this realization that you've had these ET experiences and then the Owl Connection? Well, it started in 2006. I am, uh, the, as far as the Owl stuff, um, I am 55 years old now. So in 2006, it's, uh, I would have been 44. So um, actually that's 43. I would have been, so that was, uh, so I was, living out west. And at that point, I had been reading a lot of UFO books. And part of the reason I was reading those books is because I had some memories. I had a very clear memory of seeing a UFO at night. Um, close up, it seemed. I was 12 years old at the time. I was out a window. And I, I remember me and my friend both pointed out the window. I can't remember if he said it or I said it, it was like, hey, look, what's that? And uh, we rushed right up to the glass and then looked out and there was a what looked like a coffee can kind of hovering and descending slowly at a very strange way, like a very eerie. Uh, it didn't look like any kind of craft that, that it didn't match the motions, the movements of any kind of craft. And, um, and then it ping, it just disappeared completely. And we both ran downstairs and drew it right then and there minutes later, we drew it and I still have the picture. It's on my site. Uh, and that's, that, would, that took place in 1974. Also in 1974, I had a missing time event with an associated orange flash. Now that was, I was 12 years old. That was a long time ago. In the interim, when I was 30, I woke up in the middle of the night. There was a bright light shining in the bedroom window. I was at the house alone. And I sat up on my elbow and looked out the window. And there were five gray aliens walking towards the house. Now, that's scary. That should have freaked me out. I should have ran and hid and you know, locked the doors. I didn't. It felt like I heard a very clear voice in my head say, oh, yes, they're here. Now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down. And that's exactly what I did. And the next morning, I just dismissed it all as a dream and never even bothered to look and see if there were footprints in the snow. Now, in the, that, this is in the lead up to all this. So I have those kind of core events as, as a boy and a young man and, um, and a lot of other odd synchronicities. Now, I, was, I, was, uh, I, took, I went out camping one night with a friend, just an acquaintance from town, this woman named Kristen. And we, um, we were just going out for one night. It was lovely weather, so we didn't bring a shelter. I was living in near Grand Teton National Park at the time, so there was no issues with rain or 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 we could just look at the weather and look at the sky to the south and know that it wasn't it was going to be lovely weather all night. And um, this was a stranger. This was a complete stranger. So as we're talking, and sh she says something, I'm making dinner on a big flat rock in this field of wildflowers in this amazing spot high in the Tetons, and um, she says something, and I'm like, "Oh my word, this is an impressive person." And, and then at that moment, an owl flew above us and then a second owl and then a third owl and for the next half hour excuse me excuse me like two hours 
These owls flew over us, around us, near us, landed near us, hung out on branches near us. Those were three owls. We could see them all at the same time. It was very clearly three owls kind of checking us out. And it was mystical. It was really cool. The sun went down and the stars were amazing. And lying on my back, looking up at the big sky, this is in the mountains, the, the sky would get blotted out for just one second. This, these owls were swooping right above our faces. It was magical. It was, and the owls are silent. So it's just, it was a magical, cool experience. So a few days later, um, she says, hey, let's go camping again. And I said, sure, let's do it. And so we went one more time. Four days later, went to a completely different spot of the mountains. Same thing, one night. This time it was colder. And we hiked to the top of a hill before getting in the tent because it was, um, it just felt chilly and we were just kind of, so we figured we'll warm up, we'll walk to the top of this hill, get a beautiful view of the sunset, and then we'll climb back in the tent. So we walk up the hill and at the top of the hill, we watch the sunset and an owl lands in a branch right next to us. And a second owl lands in the ground right in front of us. And a third owl is flying around above us. And this goes on for not as long as the first time, but I will say much, much, much closer. The owls were just so close. It was shocking. It was, it was remarkable. And to have it have it happen once, that was kind of cool. But to have it happen twice kind of freaked me out. It freaked both of us out. I think it freaked me out more than it did her. Something I didn't say at the time, but I'm saying now, and I have a very clear memory of a voice in my head could have been my voice, could have been an external voice, I don't know, but the voice very clearly said this internal knowing said, when looking at the owls, it said, this has something to do with the UFOs. And I started looking into my own experiences after that. I started looking into those events. I started talking to UFO researchers. I started to contact abduction researchers. I started to talk with people who've had the direct contact experience. And what I found was remarkable because the question I asked everyone is, do you have any experiences with, you, with owls? Do you have any odd experiences with owls? And it wasn't 100%, but enough that there's a very clear pattern. People would say, you know, no one's ever asked me that before. And then they would tell me a story. And the stories were remarkable. And this has been, this has been my life got kind of sidetracked at that point. Oh, and another side point here. So, I started a blog in 2009 and a lot of the blog is looking into my own experiences and little by little, the, the blog posting turned out about owls. The very first blog post is that story I just told with that friend camping. And I said, I, I, she had since long moved out of the Valley where I'd lived. And, but I remember I said, she was saying something I thought was interesting. I wrote the initial story up and I even wrote that in there. She was saying something interesting at the moment, the first owls showed up. I contacted her. After I had started the blog, after I had posted that story, I contacted her and said, what was, the, what was so interesting? What were you talking about? I remember it was really interesting, and I, but I can't remember what, exactly what it was. And she said, oh, I remember exactly what it was. The moment those first set of owls showed up on that first night, I was talking about the, my deepest, most heartfelt definition of what God means to me. Now, that, that really sort of pushed me off the edge. It really allowed me, in a way, to to be really open-minded and look at this stuff from all angles. Like I'm not a churchy and I'm neither a she in that sense, but, but it was more like there's a grand, there's something grand about this, these experiences. And then that was my, that was my introduction. So the blog eventually turned into a long format essay, which got a lot of hits and was really popular. And a lot of people gave me direct feedback. And that feedback was, this has to be a book. And I, um, I wrote the book. The first book, The Messengers, came out in the late in 2015. And the second book, Stories from the Messengers, just came out a few months ago. So I have been, um, it's been my full-time job in, in many ways doing this, this owl research. And it has proved to be so remarkable because, yes, other authors have certainly, Whitley Strieber is a perfect example, have certainly touched on the owl. But I have just thrown myself into it and it has it has been so fruitful as far as the kind of stories that have emerged have you ever figured out why the owls essentially chose you do you think your background and the fact that you're an outdoorsman had something to do with it or was there something deeper and you know looking back were any dreams and mystical events throughout your life somehow connected to this well, honestly, I have no idea because it's certainly you can live in a city and see owls. So if, if, if like the grand, you know, if the, if the people, 
you know, if the, whatever it is, whether it's the alien or the spirit enemy entities, or if the, you know, the cosmic force that controls the grand chessboard, they could have, they could have hit me with owls wherever I was, you know? So um, I don't think it necessarily means much that I was part of the outdoors. I think that, I think that may mean more as far as just my own mindset in a way, having spent so much time outside, there's just a different level of spirituality that, that I feel like I've acquired from that much time in the mountains. Now, what, what, um, and your other question was, yeah, as far as any mystical visions or dreams, either before well, I, the, the, the owls came into your experience or after. Well, I certainly had snippets of very powerful psychic experiences, but just fleeting little like blips was never consistent. Like I couldn't, I couldn't be a like a psychic, you know, at, at, you know, like at a, you know, I couldn't put a sign out on my front door and say psychic sessions, you know, come into my house. I'll do them for you. I can't, there's nothing like that, but I have had remarkable little blips throughout my life of psychic experience. So, so I've had that. And, um, and I've also uh, had powerful synchronicities and those have, those have shown up not as much as they showed up after. So those, that first set of owl sightings in, in the, in 2006, my life went crazy. Everything became unhinged at that point. I was seeing so many owls and had so many synchronicities. And these synchronicities, when you pulled on the thread and tried to decipher them in a way, all seemed to trace, trace back to owls and um, UFOs. Could you give us an example of some of the synchronicities? Well, some of them, they're in the book. Yeah, there's four others. Well, I tough to do some of them beforehand that had to do with, here, I'll tell you one that I, I don't tell very often. This was one of the very first things that happened right around the same time as um, that thing with Kristen. This is very, very benign kind of, kind of event, but the synchronicity is powerful to me. I uh, had, you know, doing the outdoor work, I would, I would get, I really had to have a good sunblock. And some sunblocks, you know, you just go to the drugstore and you pick something up and, it, and some sunblocks were actually stinging my face and I, they, they kind of made, almost gave me a rash. And I, uh, I was looking for something and people, and I asked, listen, here's my issue. Like people in the outdoor industry, they say, oh, Neutrogena 45, you get Neutrogena 45. And a bunch of people told me that and I said, great, I'll go. So I went to the drugstore in my town and they didn't have it. And right next to the drugstore is the little, um, there's a big giant grocery store and i much prefer to shop at the little drugstore little family-owned drugstore as opposed to the big uh, grocery store so i was going to turn into the big grocery store i didn't i continued home this would have been april right around this time of year and i saw that they were doing the trash collection which they do annually i was living in a very rural part of idaho they did do it annually they'll do trash collection the big trash bags on right and left on the side of the road and i knew just what it meant and i said well I'll, i do this you know so I'll, so i got home and i grabbed some trash bags and i walked along the side of the road in the front of my house and i went for a, i said i'm going to go a half mile this way to the stop sign it's exactly a half mile from my house to the stop sign along the west side of the road i'm going to cross the road to the east side and come back and do another half mile i'll do a full mile oh that feels good so as I start walking, I'm picking up trash and it's gross, right? It's like kind of wet out and it's kind of drizzling and, and the, you know, you're picking up cigarette butts and they're wet and it's, and I'm like, I felt part of me was like, I should just turn back. I'm, nope, nope. I'm going to go to the stop sign. So I start picking up more trash and then it's snowing and I'm soaked and I'm like, well, I'm not going to get any less wet now. I might as well just finish this off and be cold. So I continued on to the stop sign, wet, soaked, snowing. And I get to the stop sign and I kid you not leaning against the stop sign, like a little, like someone had set it up there for me to see was a bottle of Neutrogena 45. <laughs> and I was just like, I am not kidding. The, the, um, this is the third time of this interview. I've said it. The voice in my head said, it's them. And I didn't even know what that meant, but I was just like, it's them. I kind of was like, oh crap, this is like some UFO thing. So I was 44 years old at the time. Neutrogena 45. I was just about to turn 45. It was at a stop sign. It was at a signpost. It was leaning against, it was touching a signpost. I mean, it just, if you decipher the, 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 the sort of symbolism, not even, you don't, it's not abstract symbolism. I mean, it was a signpost. This little bottle of Neutrogena 45 was touching a signpost. I had been looking for it. I had been doing something altruistic right? I had been in the moment, which I think is tied into this. In the moment I had been saying, I'm going to, um, 
just do this nice thing for the community and just, you know, walk this mile, even though it started raining and then snowing. That one was very much the flavor of things that happened. And, the, and there's the only tie-in I have to the UFO thing, in essence, is fleeting, and it can be easily dismissed. But I did think, straight up, I thought, it's them. They staged this. Those kinds of things happen. For, for those of us that have had experiences, they have a wonderful way of, of kind of morphing reality to kind of have a special, unique message or metaphor for us. And so, you know, here you are, the, the stop, the metaphor behind the sign, the Neutrogena bottle when you were just talking about that because you wanted something that was good and healthy for you. And then whammo, there you go. And you were doing yeah. something, like you said, altruistic at, at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. All these things, all these things are part of it. So, yeah, so that was, that was one I haven't told in a long time. And I've been, and I, and I just, um, I, I just, I'm, I marvel at that one. Now, as time went on, did you start to have more ET experiences? And if you did, and that includes the totality of the experiences, the dreams, whatever astral experiences, whatever the case may be, did you see them kind of change in content or in theme in any way? Uh, was there like a discernible pattern you could d detect of, of how your experiences with ETs and or the owls kind of progressed? Well, not so much a pattern. You know, here's a pattern that was. So right after the event with the, her name was Kristen in the mountains, right after the event with Kristen, uh, seeing the three owls, two different nights, four days apart, it was pretty frenetic. Like it was not a peaceful time in my life. I was getting freaked out by all the owl sightings. I mean, I was getting freaked out. <laughs> there were so many synchronicities and so many owl sightings. I mean, I was seeing owls all the time. It culminated, like the height of the little bell curve was October of 2009. And then it eased off a little bit after that. But, but you know, it kind of built up to that and eased off after that. If there was a pattern, I think it was more me that changed. I think the, the synchronicities all kind of kept at a even pace, but I was the one that changed. And I, th and I actually literally went out into the woods one day and spoke aloud. I said, listen, like seeing so many owls, it's not working. It's making me crazy. It's your, it's like whatever you're like, it's working against me being a functional person. Cause it's, it's like, there was a point in my life and I am not exaggerating. I bet you I spent 95% of my daily waking hours wondering if I had gone insane and, and that's fatiguing. Oh yeah. And I, I literally just said, listen, if you, sh if there's an owl off in a fence post off in the distance, I ain't going to pay, I'm not going to pay attention to it. No way. It's, I just, it's, I can only, if you want my attention, get my attention, cross my path. A couple days later, I'm riding my bike down the main street of this town and this owl, I see it sitting on a tree branch off on one side of the road is totally empty street, kind of gliding downhill, just ever so slightly downhill. And this owl just tips off the tree very slowly owls have big wings that's why they fly so quietly because they have these big wings and it allows them to fly very slowly so it flew very slowly right in front of my eyes it crossed my path and then flew up and alighted on a tree on the other side of the street so like i basically asked for something and got it and and i was more it took me a while but i definitely managed to be more calm about it so yes less that the phenomena changed and more that i changed i'll say now, if one didn't know any better, it's almost as if they responded to your request when you were speaking out loud in, in the woods and they oh, kind yes, of I eased agree. the throttle back a little bit. I agree completely, yeah. I was still seeing them off in the distance, and I was just like, nope, that doesn't count. <laughs> and I lived in a place with a lot of owls, so it wasn't unusual to see, a lot, to see owls occasionally. But I, I mean, I had been living there 20 years. I lived there totally 25 years. And so there was only the last what is it like between 2009 and 2014? So about six years, the last six years. When I, and I was always aware of owls and birds and stuff like that. I loved birds and loved owls. And I always liked seeing them and I always was happy to see them in, in kind of just a straight, you know, birding kind of thing. But it, in the last six years, it was crazy. And um, so I'm, so yes, yeah, so that, so, and as far as like the totem, animal you know so there's like so many avenues you can go down you can go to ancient greece and the the you know um athena in her goddess of wisdom and her companion owl or you can go to sort of you know present day 
uh, totem animals within, you know, in our culture, I guess that would be more than Native Americans here would have. And then within that, that's their, their reading on these things are all over the map. But the, for the most part, the owl would be symbolic of an animal that can fly into the night. And, and this is consistent in a lot of cultures all over the world where an owl flies into the night, which must have been remarkable for ancient man. They would have recognized that owls can do this. And, they, and then, you know, we have no ability to do that, to see into the darkness. They knew that the owl could see in the darkness. And then that becomes a metaphor for traveling to other realms, traveling to the land of the ancestors, traveling to the land of the dead, traveling to the land of the gods, you know, passing that veil. That would be the that would be the symbol of the owl. Now, the, take that one step further. The owl returns. So the owl is returning with a message. It's a night totem. It's these are heavy internal messages. You know, there's other animals, eagles, for instance, right? That's a daylight. That's a symbol of Zeus. That's a symbol of masculinity. That's got association with the sun and the and and men and the bright you know and so there that the the sign of the eagle is much more the sign of the ego and, and, and accomplishments the sign of the owl is very feminine sign of the moon the moon is on a 28 day cycle just like women are it's the sign of the night it's the sign of looking inward this is all very i mean i'm generalizing here but this is that's kind of at the core of the mythologies that that are part of owl lore the fact that we're made up mostly of water, how the moon affects us at a very Absolutely. deep level. And it's always been a quest for a lot of people down through the ages to delve into those hidden realms where we can learn more about ourselves and you know, our place in the overall scheme of things. So, you know, it's not surprising that this intelligence, whatever it may be, would utilize owls as kind of a messenger. And I think that's part of the reason I'm guessing why you use the word the messengers as a title of your book. You know, the reason that came about was, was um, I was getting, so what happened is I started, you know, with a website, you know, and your blog and the, and the posting the owl stories. I put right on the very top of my page. It's still there. Like, I want to hear your owl stories, contact me. And people did. And I started getting these stories and it wasn't too long. And, you know, this is, so you go, you Google UFO owl, just Google it. My name is the first thing that comes up some connection to my name. And then after that, it's like the next 15 is me. The next 15 hits on Google. So if anyone in the whole world, and that's been like that for a decade almost, if anyone in the whole world has a story with a UFO and an owl, they're going to find me. So I'm getting I'm getting hit with so many stories from all over the world. Uh, they got have to be English speaking um, before I can really decipher them. But <laughs> so I've gotten a few that I have to use Google Translate. But um. So in those letters, people would say, oh, the owl came to my house and this and that. And then, and then they would just skip. They would just, wouldn't call it the owl anymore. They would just call it the messenger with no prompting. These aren't mystical people. These are just folks saying like, oh, I had this powerful owl experience. And the owl was in my, you know, on the tree. And then, you know, I looked up and I looked at the messenger and it was hooting. And it was right there. I didn't have to do much to, to, to see that pattern. And it was just a tidy name. A friend of mine, actually, I was calling it Messengers of Night, the initial book title. And she said, no, no, just call it The Messengers. Well, it's interesting because it's, it's bringing memories back to me. Uh, I mentioned uh, before we started how uh, uh, my partner, Kylie, she used to be followed by an owl almost every day, every weekday coming home from school. If I remember her story correctly. There would be an owl either waiting for her at a particular stretch of, of the walk home or it would follow her. And then in, in my own case, there was actually a family of owls. Uh, I forget the name of the owls here. They're called the horny-faced uh, frog owl or something. And they don't look like conventional owls. I'm in Australia, so they, these oh, owls... Oh, I was going to say you're in Australia. As soon as you said that, frog mouth owl, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. There was like a family of them at one point. And I would see them lined up on a big branch in the tree in front of our house. And, you know, we, they were there for a while because the rodents would get into our barbecue at night and kind of, you know, rummage around looking for scraps. And so the owls were there ready, ready to pounce. Right. And eventually we didn't have a rat problem anymore because I guess the owls took care of them, but they still hung around for a little while. And I always drew some kind of comfort. I mean, they would be right there on, on the railing 
sometimes in daylight, right? So I always thought they were really neat. And then, Oh, you know, they are. And I agree. They're wonderfully neat. Yes. Yes. They help us in, in many ways. They, they, if there's like a, a varmint problem, so to speak, then, you know, that's what they're there for. And I always felt a sense of reassurance because I'd hear that, that slight thrumming sound they make. I don't know, you know, it's kind of like a humming sound. They, they emanate from their chest or some of them. Some of them do that. And when I would hear that, I would know they were up in the tree. I, I would go, okay, the owls are here again. So it was very reassuring to me, uh, Mike, that I knew they were out there. Yeah, and I mean, it's reassuring to me too. I mean, we have them around the house here and we hear them at night and sometimes I just recognize, oh, it's only an owl. What I do do now, which is, I'll say like, is you're in a conversation and the owl hoots. I'm like, what were we talking about right now? Right at that moment, right at the moment the owl is hooting. Um, my partner, Andrea, and I both have had experiences. So we're often talking about UFOs. So it's, so it's not uncommon for us to be talking about UFOs or like something spiritual. And then the owls will hoot right out the door, wow. right out the window. And, and this is ever... something that it's, oh, oh and I, this is something so in the letters. I mean, I get people who are reading the book and I have, you know, they'll say, well, I was reading the book and I would sit down and I'd open up the book and the owl would be hooting right out my window. And I'd close my book and the owl would stop. Wow. And I'd open the book again, it would start again, you know? And so... She, uh, when she finished the book, she said the owl stopped and she said, well, maybe they flew off to find someone else who was reading your book. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the UFO activity in your area, did it, after you came out with the messenger's book, did you notice any kind of a marked increase in sightings or any more no, UFO I related ever, I, Yeah. I don't really have sightings. I mean, the few sightings I've had have been few and far between. You know, it was less the dreams and things like that. It was more just like it felt like I didn't need that. I didn't need any kind of confirmation at that point. You know, like I would done so much research and I talked to so many people. Like I didn't know what he needed to tell me that there's a real phenomenon. So I didn't, I felt like sometimes the, the UFO sighting is this event that's meant to, you know, to get your attention. And I didn't, I felt like I didn't need that. So yeah, I haven't really, in, you know, and I've been fairly clear about this. I haven't seen that many things that I would call a UFO. A few, I certainly have. And um, I have one story that takes the last 40 pages of the book or so. And that's a long, complicated story that involves three different events. And each event sounds like a UFO abduction event in some level. And there was certainly, it, it wasn't a UFO because it was on the ground. So it wasn't flying. But there was a big disc-shaped building. Hmm. That's what I called it at the time. I was sleeping outside under the stars. And off on this hilltop, I was down in the desert in Utah all alone. And on this hilltop, there was this big, I woke up in the middle of the night and said, that's really weird. Why would someone build a building right there? That's ridiculous. And it looked like there's a T there's a movie called sleeper with Woody Allen. And, and there's some famous modern building that was in Colorado, but this looked like that building. And that's what I thought. It's like this big round kind of, it looked like a building shaped like a flying saucer. It looked like a landed flying saucer. And I even remember lying there in my sleeping bag and I'm like, I got some psychic mojo. Like, I, I feel like I'm a pretty intuitive guy, you know, like, let me see. Like, and I just kind of like tried to sense, is there anything weird about this thing? You know, I just was silent and tried to almost meditate on it. And I was like, nope, that's a building. And um, so later I went back to that spot and there's nothing there. And there's wow. nothing on the maps. And it's and if there had been a building there, it would have been big because it was a long ways away. And to put a building on that hilltop or even anything on that hilltop, I actually wondered whether it might be like a water tank or some sort of um, like, I don't know, like cell tower thingy or something, but in nothing. Any, any of those things would have had a road that goes up there is nothing. You can clearly see all that on, on Google Earth. And... Um, I, you know, went right to the spot and there's nothing there. And it was way too big to be like a motorhome or something like that. It was way too big to be a motorhome. It was whatever it was, it was something big. Wow. Yeah. And then that event. Yeah. Utah has got, especially Southern Utah has got a wild vibe and it's got all, you know, it's, it just looks cool. Right. I mean, that's, it looks, that's where all the, the, the desert sandstone towers are and such. Now, over time, did any of your family and friends begin, you know, besides your, your, your partner and the people you were closely associated with, did, did others start coming up to you and say, I had this weird experience with an owl, you know, when I was on my way to work or something? A little bit. Oh, yeah, I hear a lot of owl stories. Yeah, yeah. So I've heard some, yeah, some wonderful owl stories. Some of them are a little more mystical. And actually, you know, owls are associated with death, too. Yes, so yes. So a lot of people, after, after someone passes, an owl will show up at their home or at the funeral. And um, that's very common. 
so I've, I've collected a lot of those and those are actually quite moving, touching stories have nothing at all to do with UFOs, but everything to do with the lore of the owl, right? So the owl messenger, what happens is people talk to the owl as if it's their lost relative. I have a lot of examples of that where, where people will speak to the owl as if it's their, usually a parent, either the mom or their dad will have died and they'll talk to the owl as if it's their parent. And um, I have some really remarkable stories that are documented in the first book on that. Like a form of like closure in some way where they would, you know, be able to impart Absolutely, some kind of message. Yeah. yeah. They would say that stories they would tell me is like, like one woman said, this is very interesting. It's a long complex story and it's tied into this other person. Two women died. One, they were sisters. They, they were born 11 years apart and they died 11 days apart. Wow. One is named Lon and his cousin is named Jill, right? So this, the mothers are sister. So Lon and Jill are cousins and they both 11 days apart. The mothers died. So they almost had like a tandem funeral event for, for the, for the memory of, of their, of their parents. Now, Jill had said, I'm grieving at one point, well after the, after the death, she said, I'm still grieving and I can't get over it and I need something. And her close friend said, just wait, there'll be a sign. You'll know. And the next morning she gets up and walks into her garage and she moves a bucket, which is another thing is total symbolism of death. She moves a bucket on a shelf and there's an owl on the shelf, a little, a screech owl and they're tiny. They're cute. And she takes pictures of it. It's on a shelf. She's it's in a garage. I got pictures in the book. She's taking pictures of it. And, and um, she calls up her friend or her cousin, Lon and says, Lonnie, like, it's mom. She's here in the garage. And she, and she talk on the phone, like, you know, Lonnie, or mom, it's Lonnie. I have Lonnie on the phone. And it went on and on. And, and she has a couple things about the story. That shelf, everything in the, everything in the garage was her husband's. And that shelf was her, her only, that was her shelf. That was, she kept her stuff. So the owl was on her shelf. Wow. The garage door was closed. She doesn't know how it got in. She opened the garage door. The owl wouldn't leave. It's Thanksgiving. They went out and, and had Thanksgiving dinner, came back, and the owl was still on the shelf. She said, Mom, I got the message. Got the message. <laughs> oh, thank you. And that shows up a lot, too. We're like, you basically have to, like, I got it. Thank you. And the owl flew off, and she never saw the owl again. She'd lived in Florida for 27 years and had never seen an owl. Wow. So, and then Lon had his own set of wild owl synchronicities associated with his mom's death. Now, this gets, so 11 days apart, I met Lon under kind of, you know, someone said, you know, Mike, you need to talk to this guy, Lon. He's got a beautiful owl story. I talked with Lon. We got along really wonderfully. He's an amazing, I, I respect the guy. His name is Lon Friend. He used to write for um, a magazine called Rip, which is a, a heavy metal magazine. And my mom died the same year. So Lon's mother died 11 days later. Jill's mother died. 11 days later, my mother died. I mean, who is, that's, who is, and we've all had powerful owl synchronicities. And I had a remarkable owl synchronicity on the, on the evening that my mother died, where I was at my sister's house because I was with my, I was just, I'm very cautious to tell this story because it's emotional for not only me, but my family members. But I, I've been telling it more recently. It was a, very gentle, peaceful passing for my mom. I was there. I was holding her hand. My sister was on the other side of the bed holding my mother's hand. She had been sick for years and it was a relief and we all knew it. And the next day that happened at three in the morning, the next day was totally, we were all fried. We'd been up with mom for days and days and, and we're fatigued and we're emotional and we're grieving and we're in the backyard and we're on the, my sister has a big couch and she lives in the South and, and there's a big couch in the back porch and we're all on the back porch and the neighbor is there. My brother and sister are there. And my brother and sister don't really, they're, they don't know what to think of me. This owl stuff. And at the time I would get up in the morning, right? I was there for days at my, at my sister's house. You know, Jeannie, I'm doing this owl thing. Like this stuff, look here, I'll just open the email. I'll watch this. Is, I'll just read an email. This came in today, right now. Here's an email. And I tell the weirdest story that involved an owl and a UFO. And she was like, what is going on? I could tell she had no clue how to process this. So I um, am sitting on the back porch between my brother and sister. 
Across from me is Jeannie's very close friend, Ruthie, lives right across the street. And Ruthie's very Southern, very polite, very formal. And she says, Jim, my brother, sister, and I, Jim, Jean, Mike, I need to tell you a story. I know there is an afterlife. I know there's an afterlife. And I know because of an owl. And when she said that, my brother and sister flinched. I mean, they physically <laughs> flinched. And, and I literally, my sister literally put her hands over her ears. Like, she's like, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. And, um, and I was like, she could see Ruthie's expression. Like, what did I say? And I said, Ruthie, you don't know this, but I've been doing this owl research. My brother and sister know it. I want to hear the story. Please hear the story. So she told a very typical story. One I've heard in one form or another many times. She was grieving. There was a path right around the neighborhood there, this nature path that kind of goes through the woods. So there's a, you know, maintained nature path. She would walk this nature path every day as part of her grieving process. And every day she would pass an owl. There's this owl on a branch, on a low branch. And then one day she said like, owls don't hang, owls aren't out of the day. She was always comforted by the owl, but she said, owls don't come out in the day, what's going on? And so she looked at this owl, she walked right up to it and she said, are you my dad? And in that moment, she felt a tremendous relief and all her grieving seemed to melt away. And the owl flew off and she never saw it again. This doesn't have anything to do with UFOs, but it has everything to do with the owl lore, in my opinion, this power. Yes, because you know, the closure element, the, the hidden realms, the, the afterlife, it, it, it's all there. Now, you know, here we and are. And I'll add to that. Please. So when I do UFO research, when I do UFO research and talk to people who've seen strange things in the sky, I will always ask, what was going on in your life leading up to the event? And then the next question is, what changed in your life after the event? Excellent and questions. The, yeah. And this is, and there's, so they're Ruthie and the woman Jill. They were grieving. They saw the owl. The grieving was alleviated. So that's, that's the totem right there, whether it's grieving or whether it's some other challenge. It took me years of seeing owls <clears throat> to get past what I would call the frenetic unease of my, of my UFO experiences. But I think that's what they were there for. Now, you know, here we are in linear time. We know there's a past, present, and a future. Have these owl experiences or the owl stories ever suggested anything of like a portentous event in someone's life or like a harbinger of something to come or, you know, whether good or bad or kind of a warning or, or reassurance, whatever the case may be. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes it's UFO contact and sometimes it's, I mean, sometimes it's the one woman, um, uh, Oh, I'm drawing a complete blank on her name. I apologize. She's actually, she's the woman that coined the term exopolitics. And here, let me just. Look uh, yeah, her name escapes me. Well, I got the book right in front of me because I think she's right in the. Wouldn't be Carol Rosen. I think that's someone else. No, it's not Carol Rosen. And it's, but it's, she looks like Carol Rosen, actually. She's, she's a very handsome woman with a big, big, great uh, head of you know, white hair. Oh, I'll think of it here. I'm so, forgive me. I'm sorry. But she was at a point in her life with a lot of contact. She's living in Phoenix which is another great metaphor, right? Phoenix. Oh, yes. The rebirth and the rising out of the ashes. And she was literally in a mundane shopping mall parking lot. Full daylight. She walks out. She looks up. There's a huge owl on a, on a, on a light post in the parking lot. Huh. She looks up at this owl and she gets a direct telepathic message. And the message is, you are not who you seem to be. And later that night, she said she had, UFO contact. And I said, do you think it was a real owl? And she said, no, which is a really good answer. I mean, that's a really honest answer. Cause I mean, she said, no, I don't think it was a real owl. I think it was some sort of projection. I think it was some sort of, some sort of projection. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think she didn't say no, like she wasn't sure, but she said she felt it was some sort of projection and not a real owl. She, she couldn't obviously know for certain, but this is, and, and, uh, so the portent of there was that she had UFO contact that same evening. Now, I've also heard some really, you know, there's sad stories of owls showing up and then within 24 hours, a relative or uh. someone dies. That 
that shows up. It's very rare, but what is much more common is for someone to die and an owl to show up. Now, have there been instances when people have seen an owl? Like, for example, in that story you just mentioned, the woman kind of intuitively felt it wasn't a real owl. It could have been a projection. Have there ever been instances in, in these stories they have collated where people will say something like, well, the owl just disappeared or like, you know, some kind of metaphysical or, or mystical occurrence transpired regarding the owl. Oh, it's Rebecca Hardcastle Wright. I just looked it up. That was the woman. So yes, she's the woman who coined the phrase exopolitics and she published a book some over a decade ago, I think titled exopolitic. Yes. There's some very mystical experiences with owls. And then, you know, one, sometimes they're just visionary experiences. This one woman um, had been having a lot of owl experiences. She was studying shamanism. She wanted to become a shamanism. She was working with, with a, not really a guru, like an elder, like someone was helping her along the way. She was going through the initiation process. She was using mushrooms as her, as her, as her medicine for journeying. And she said, okay, today's the day. I'm going to take a big heroic dose of mushrooms and I'm going to sit in my room alone and I'm going to, today is the day. So she was all alone, which is something she'd never done before. She'd always been with someone sort of shepherd, shepherding her through the, the psychedelic experience. And she was confronted with a giant vision of an owl and the owl spoke to her. And I have to look it up to get the exact words, but she felt like the owl was saying, you are moving from mother to crone, you are moving to a new chapter of your life. So she went through a transition and she came out of it and she started taking the, the shamanic work very seriously. So there's an obviously, obviously there's no real owl in the room. She's taking mushrooms, trippy, psychedelic, but a visionary experience that she did very formally and, and requested as, you know, so what was going on in your life before seeing that psychedelic owl? What's going on is before I requested to have a powerful experience to help me move through this process of becoming a shaman. Afterwards, she became a shaman. So yeah, so this is so there and there are certainly stories of the of the screen memory of owls that show up very mystically. You know, like uh, appearing in roads. You know, the four foot tall owls that are bigger than they should be. I have some accounts where there'll be three people in the car. Two people will scream in utter terror as they turn a corner. And the third person will say, what are you screaming for? That's just a big owl. <laughs> and the other two will say, that was a gray alien standing on the side of the road. So, yeah, so there's this, it gets very murky when you try to, and, I've, and what I've done is given up, right? I've given up. I've given up trying to come up with concrete answers. I just dance around what might be the answer and, and let the stories speak for themselves. These can be a catalyst for change in people's life. They're a milestone, a guidepost. There's a, a marked before and a marked after and a transition for these people that experience the owl in their, their lives. And the story you just told or an example you just told of, of like the four-foot owl masking as an, as an illusion for an alien, for example. Sometimes people would see the gray and then another person would see like a four-foot owl. That, that's what you're yep. saying? Wow. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was three people in the car driving along, turn a corner. They're on the side of the road. Two people scream instantly. Ah! And the third guy goes, what are you screaming for? That's just an owl. But he, he perceived said, oh. it as a very big owl. He perceived it as a very big owl. <laughs> <And> that's <laughs> kind of weird too. I don't know. Well, that's kind of weird too. So <laughs> I, I did you know what I did and I did, I did it for my presentations and I, I have a cardboard owl. It's cut out of cardboard. I just got a big piece of, I had a four foot tall piece of cardboard. I painted an owl on it. I'm an illustrator. So cut it out and I made a little stand for it, you know, like, uh, so it stood up and I could take it on stage at a presentation. And I also had a, a 20, I think that's 27 inch owl. And I kind of decided that that's about as big as an owl as you're ever going to see anywhere on planet Earth. So if someone said, I saw, I saw an owl and they kind of made a little height about 27 inches long, I would go, you know, I'm going to give you that one. That's possible. So I made a 27-inch tall owl and a four-foot tall owl. And let me tell you, there is no way you can kind of, kind of go, oh, I just saw a four-foot tall owl. Mm, what do you know? There's no way. It is, it is, it's, 
berserkly enormous. <laughs> and I, what I did is I did a bunch of things. I took it out on the road at night and I took pictures of it on a lonely road, this cardboard owl. It's <laughs> obviously just a cardboard cartoon of an owl, but it does give you a very good sense of, of how ridiculous it sounds. I mean, it may not sound ridiculous, but you put the visual to it. And it's it's outrageous that people could say, oh, I saw a four foot tall owl and not think anything of it. Or a three foot tall owl or whatever they say, five foot tall. I've heard, you know, the three and a half to four feet tall is usually what I'm hearing. Yeah, that should be a red flag. And Yeah, a big one, yeah. Yeah, and, and from some of the stories that I've come across over the years in my alien abduction and, and UFO research, it would be a scenario where either at the end of an encounter or – kind of in a missing time thing and the last thing they remember seeing is like an owl perched up on their the hood of their car or like a owl looking into their like windshield or something and that's the last thing they remember before they black out and then you know lo and behold they do a regression later and it wasn't an owl at all but it was a gray or some other et correct yes yeah, so that shows up in the literature all over the place. But it's not only owls, it's deer, it's big squirrels, it's firemen, you know, there's clowns, you know, other things show up too, you know, as part of the screen maybe. But it seems to be that the owl is right up there at the top of the list as far as that. That's the one that it's hard to say because there's no real true data pool that we can we can scrutinize and study and, and put on a spreadsheet. But there's a, owls anecdotally are pretty high on the list as far as what people associate most i would say deer and owls which both have a symbolic lore and are both common animals too so. yes and both have you know kind of big eyes and big and, nocturnal and, eyes yeah, and, and, and they, yeah, they eyes, have yeah. to because you know deer being you know preyed upon they have to be able to see around them and whatnot and of course the the lore of the owls the ability to see at night must have been like you pointed out earlier astonishing to the ancients you know they can yeah. you know fly around and their eyes glow and in, in some instances we're almost reached the end of the first segment, and this has been a fascinating discussion with Mike Cleland. Mike, do you want to give your book information and how people can get a hold of your books and contact you if they've got any owl stories? The book, the first book is titled The Messengers. The subtitle is Owls, Synchronies, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee, and uh, that's, a, that's about 400 pages long. That's a big, fat book. The next book is about 250 pages long. It's a little more modest. Um, it's called Stories from the Messengers, and it is uh, the subtitle is Accounts of Owls, UFOs, and a Deeper Reality. And both these books are available on Amazon. They're super easy to find. If you have any trouble and you can't remember my name, just type in UFOs, Owls, or UFO, Owl, into Google. My name is going to be the first thing that comes up. So you can go to my site, and just uh, there's links all over my site um, to get to the, to the Amazon page. Okay, we've reached the end of the first segment with our very special guest, Mike Cleland. For those of you listening, if you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.